Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode or season one, episode one of the FPL script. This is a FPL podcast hosted by myself, FPL Fran and my friend JD. I myself am a bit more of a novice when it comes to playing FPL. This is my third year playing and I am someone who's sunk a lot of hours into trying to improve my process in FPL. And this year is, for example, one of the first years that I've looked at integrating models to my approach. And so, of course, rightly, I'm, I'm with uh, JD here, as I mentioned. I myself am a Madridista and a Real Madrid fan, of course. So. I don't really have a subjective bias when it comes to the Premier League, but um, of course I have many more grassy tendencies, as you can see with uh, my background as well. Yeah, and I'm the other co-host of the FPL script. Uh, My name is JD, and you can find me on Twitter at the Richard and Freudist, but with a one instead of an I, because, you know, all the good names are always taken on Twitter. Uh, I've been a United fan, a Manchester United fan, for (laughs) almost 19 years now, and... Also, the Spanish national team fan, um, and so is Fran. And, you know, we had some fantastic times before. We had we have had a rough patch of around 10, 12 years now. So hopefully things will get better. But other than that, I build data models for fantasy games other than FPL. So you might have seen my content about Euro 2020 or World Cup 2022. And, you know, I have formal training in data analysis and machine learning. So I try to utilize that um, for FPL. And um, hopefully through the podcast, we'll be able to bring value to your FPL experience. Yeah, and just a little bit more about the podcast. I feel like the main episodes that we'll run are a almost state of the game week type of podcast where we look at the main decisions that a lot of people will be looking at on a week to week basis and how that fits in within the landscape of FPL, both medium and long term. So within the next eight to nine game weeks or with the context of whatever chip strategies people have in mind. So Let's say if we're to talk about this game week in context, game week 31, there still is a decision for some managers about free hitting on 32, 34, and 37. So those are the kind of things that we'll talk about and discuss as we go through the narrative of a certain game week. So, uh, and the other part of the content that we are offering is a timeless series of sorts where we interview um, much more experienced managers than the two of us and try to understand how they approach the game, you know, long-term strategies, um, how they have carved out a niche within the FPL meta and try to see how we can better equip ourselves to kind of handle, you know, FPL as it comes every week. Perfect. I mean, that's a good segue to game week 31 as we sort of sit. You and I had very, very similar teams this week. We both got 59 points. The only difference within our teams is actually uh, me playing Madison and Matoma and then you playing actually Matoma and McAllister. So, sorry. Of course, Mac- Madison McAllister were the main differences, um, yeah. but I at least had to weigh up whether I, I put McAllister on my bench. So I guess uh, I'll give myself some credit there for uh, going for the old two-pointer in Madison, who has been one of my worst transfers so far this season. Um, but this week was all about going for Erling Haaland, putting the captaincy on him. And I feel like a lot of managers lost out because the effective ownership of Haaland in most ranks was something around 150%. So him getting 12 points, being the better captaincy option, from an actual points point of view, uh, was very kind to us. In, in a week where Rashford had ample opportunities to, to do well, and he actually had an effective ownership of something like 120%, and also some other differential players within certain teams also had great opportunities to do well. So Tony, who was usually the make weight for a lot of managers towards Holland, um, he missed a penalty as well. And Salah, for a lot of managers who sort of jumped the curve and, and, and dropped Kane in their teams, he also racked up the highest ever XG total in his career um, in this singular game versus Arsenal, but only amassed five points. But I think you also have something to add when it comes to missing out on points and uh, Mitoma and McAllister. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, PGMOL has apparently apologized to Brighton because uh, clearly uh, they did their best to not let Brighton get anything from that game, and you know, it it was uh, such an incompetent show because I both of them deserved plenty more points, and um, you know, apart from that, I think the main where managers kind of deferred is between Kane Watkins and sort of Tony Sala because the the other two players both missed penalties and both of them are or uh, at least Tony is an exceptional penalty taker it was his first penalty miss I think in the Premier League and uh, you know Salah missing another one and f- uh, racking up humongous XG 
is kind of where I think uh, the the game is diverged. And fortunately for you and I, we both had. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think defense is potentially an interesting point to start off with because the defenders have not really gotten any points in FPL as of late. Uh, people who went into Shaw last week suffered. People who went into Chilwell more recently um, or further back rather suffered as well. And, and now Chilwell is already seen as a transfer out. Shaw has an injury. And we're also looking at our team and some people who don't have Arsenal defenders because they went out for some of the double game weakers are once again reconsidering whether they move into, you know, back into the Arsenal defense uh, or to embrace maybe even the, the minutes risk that is going to be the city defense. And of course, this show is aptly named Expected Minutes. Um, where do you sort of sit in terms of defense priorities this week? particularly if, if let's say Shaw should be ready and back for game week 34 and maybe you could keep him on your bench and therefore Chilwell becomes that sort of prime target because even though he has a home fixture it's versus Brighton I can't really see an opportunity for Chilwell to get a clean sheet there even though um, he was rested and rotated and probably will still start the next game yeah no definitely I think um, for uh, people who own Chilwell I think it's an easy transfer out whether it's this week or it's in game week 33 basically trying to prepare for game week 34 and i think you know if you can't get to trent i think there are maybe city defenders that you want to go for but you know uh, the biggest issue with city defenders as we all know is minutes you know ds might be starting but he's more expensive than chilwell now having gotten a price rise and ak and stones while they are nailed and mostly nailed and you know that mostly word being the keyword and, uh, you know, uh, they are playing excellently right now, right? Like they did um, in the Bayern game today, which and we are recording this episode on the off the back of that. So I think that if you are convinced that Stones or Ake are going to keep their place and keep playing every week, you know, they are reasonable transfers in, I think, in this game week because you, um, and assuming you are free eating in 32 because, of course, that is the main caveat to most of our discussion going into 31 and 32 because both of us are free eating in 32. So we don't really care about owning City, Brighton, United assets because we'll just be having them out on 32 and then getting them back for 33 as part of the free hit. So in terms of that, I think these are kind of the viable assets you can consider. And if you, if you even if you look at reviews, um, expected value projections i think these are the players that stand out and of course when you talk about trent if you rate liverpool's chances of keeping a clean sheet then naturally roberts and van dyke come into the conversation but again it's the same thing about x minutes do you believe that these players have enough x minutes for you to justify that transfer if you do then it's a straightforward move but i think there are many factors to consider like the pattern in which Trent, Robertson and Van Dijk have been getting the rest. Van Dijk to a lesser extent, but I think Trent and Robertson uh, more more towards uh, getting rotated. So, and um, you know, uh, I'm sure you have an opinion on Van Dijk uh, and we'll get to that. But uh, in general, I think that minutes is, of course, as always the key, but especially now because Chilwell himself, uh, the only reason we need to transfer him out is minutes. So what do you have to say about Van Dijk and, you know, the, the defenders that we are thinking about? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I think the only differential that I might add is maybe Pedro Porro from Spurs because I have been running multiple solves and, and he does come up quite frequently and, and is actually quite close to someone like um, a Diaz on, on EV. And that's because I actually have money in the bank. So in the context where you don't have money in the bank, you can't go from Chilwell to Diaz. I think it actually at that point makes sense to go down to Pedro Porro if you really think Chilwell is such a big problem point in your team, or you need a, a make weight of sorts, and therefore Pedro Porro would be that guy. As far as going back to Virgil van Dijk and Robertson, I feel like Robertson is that asset where it reminds me of actually Game Week 25, where some people, of course, benefited from Robertson the first game, then he got rested out. But the reason why you want to go for assets like Robertson and Trent is, is the slightly higher upside with the more consistent ex expected goal involvement. And I think, therefore, Trent just trumps Robertson because his numbers are far superior. And then with Van Dyke, you, you get what you sh usually should be, the permanency, right? Because the reason why Van Dyke actually outscored Robertson in the end was because he got that clean sheet in the second leg fixture. And, of course, he scored the goal um, within gaming 25. But... Van Dijk has suffered from a bit of poor form as of late. He's fortunate, I suppose, in that the fact that the other center backs within Liverpool have all been, frankly, terrible and also bailed out by Allison for the most part. So I, I guess what I would say is just go for the upside with Trent because 
usually what happens when when these players get rested and rotated is that they only get rested and rotated for one match it's not like trent gets dropped for the foreseeable future or something like that he had a fantastic game at least in the second half versus arsenal classic um you know instances of, of him doing poorly i suppose in the first half from a defensive point of view but that's something i think at this point liverpool understand that that's just the double-edged sword that they're playing with when they have trent on the field so in my opinion yeah go for trent otherwise go for a city defender like a a a diaz or probably ake i think at this point because i feel like what luke has also mentioned is that stones has struggled from an injury point of view or recovering from injuries yep. so him needing to have to manage his minutes with the ucl sort of reminds me of him being now peps mares right from the sort of midfield position because he now also occupies a new role within the team now that city rsc sort of playing this three two two three structure right so that makes um stones a little bit of a, a risk right when it comes to premier league minutes and therefore maybe ake could just be more interesting because when we've seen other people play left back this season for city i feel like it, it's paled in comparison but maybe laporte can obviously play there too if we move towards the midfield though what do you think is the state of the midfield some managers do own madison some own rashford so what are your thoughts on that yeah so i i think that in terms of transfers out i think madison is a priority for most FPL managers just because um, from what we have heard today, the rumors are that Rashford might not be out for long. And if that is the case, I think it merits him being on the bench rather than you transferring him out because you're going to need him back immediately when he's back to full fitness or even if he's kind of fit because if he plays 60 to 70 minutes in a double game week, you'll take that over many midfielders. So I think in that sense, if Madison out is your priority transfer i think it comes down to who you go for and the two divergent paths right now is a you go for Grealish, and b you go for back to an arsenal mid and the reason i say back is i know that most players have come from <laughs> arsenal mids to someone like madison so uh, with Grealish, i think definitely you know great minutes right now and pep's playing him whenever he can and also review rates him pretty highly and i think it's the suggested move for many managers who own madison or probably need someone to play when they have rashford shaw and chilwell on the bench because if you plan on keeping all three of them i'm assuming that is going to be your bench so you have no player coming on so you need like players who are going to play for sure so in that sense i think Grealish is a good option and if we think about the need for Grealish, I think the primary thing we are talking about is game weeks 31 and 33. If you are free eating in 32 again. So because once we get to 34, I assume that the midfielder you bring in is going to be your make way for Salah. So if that is the case, then I think you can just look at the two game weeks in isolation. And from a slightly myopic point of view, you can make a decision. And the, the other way is going to uh, Odegaard or Martinelli. And... In terms of their minutes expectations, I think Martinelli, if he has the same minutes as Odegaard, is definitely a better asset. But the question is, is, is does he have equal minutes to Odegaard? Because surprisingly, Odegaard was subbed and, you know, in the game against Liverpool and he looked shocked as well. But I don't foresee that to continue. But I think that with all the attackers fit, I think Martinelli and Trossard is the kind of rotation you would expect to, expect to see with uh, Jesus building up his minutes every single game week. Because I think he just has a different impact on the team as we've seen since he's come back. And it just makes sense to kind of manage uh, the left wing between Trossard and Martinelli. Um, I don't know, uh, what are your thoughts on kind of managing these Arsenal mids through uh, the two game weeks that we're talking about? Yeah, I, th I think as you said, because if you look at the 31-33 fixtures, it's Arsenal versus West Ham away, then of course City away as well. So... If you're really just considering between Martinelli and Odegaard and it's a short-term gamble, I would probably just go with Martinelli at this point in time. Seeing that Jesus is still lacking in fitness for probably 31, because you can still see he's like a 60-minute sub, he really does gas himself because the way he plays, extremely high octane, high press. So that's kind of why I feel like Martinelli just makes sense as a transfer option. Uh, because you're probably also looking to get much less from the City game. So even if, let's say, Martinelli will get rested and rotated, um, a little bit more within the city game in terms of the X men's aspects that you're still getting the value from West Ham and that fixture there. So I feel like I would just go with Martinelli at that point, slightly 
what seems like higher upside at least, even though actually underlying stats uh, have been very, very close between Odegaard and Martinelli, I think over the whole season, they're both at something like 0.31 XG and then 0.25 um, XA per 90. So interesting there. Uh, but Martinelli, of course, someone who's completely outscored his uh, expected goals tally. But just to actually touch back on what you were saying with um, who the transfers out are, on Madison Rashford, I just wanted to add a little short little tidbit as a Madison owner and a depressed one, but I, I basically put Rashford's X-Mins on review as zero and until the end of the season. And, and for some reason, you know, Madison is still clearly the, the best transfer out for me. And I think for a lot of managers now, because of the price rises and the price changes, that's going to be the case because Rashford has now fallen to 6.9 in terms of real terms value for people who've been holding him for a long time. Um, and I think a lot of us have kept Rashford through thick and thin, unless you're yep. someone like FPL Jan who wildcarded off of him. So that's the sort of landscape right now where it seems like Grealish is the best transfer from Madison. And um, I would 100% advise keeping Rashford. If we w go back to that topic about 31-33, the reason why these Arsenal players are are the topic is, is because, um, as you mentioned, Salah is going to come into our teams in 34. But one of the big topics this week as well was Jurgen Klopp mentioning that he would have a discussion with Salah over the penalty taking duties because he's just missed two penalties. But you've actually compiled some data for us um, to kind of share on that. Yeah, so I mean, I have spoken to a couple of Liverpool supporters who are into analytics and they have held a lot like a belief that Salah has never been an elite penalty taker and they always wanted Fabinho to be on penalties whenever Fabinho has been on the pitch. And as you can see on the screen, uh, Fabinho has a much better penalty record compared to Salah. So Fabinho has converted 24 out of 25 penalties he's taken in club football, which is a 96% conversion rate. And uh, if you contrast that with Salah, Salah has scored 30 out of 37, which gives him an 81% conversion rate, which is almost the same as an average penalty taker because the XG of a penalty is 0 0.8. So if you look at it from that point of view, the, the biggest problem, I think, is that the fact that he has missed two penalties in a row and both of the penalties have, result, uh, have uh, resulted in the result of the game being different because they could have drawn against Bournemouth if he had scored and they could have won against Arsenal. Of course, it doesn't work like that and it's foolish to suggest that it would have worked exactly like that. But all I have to say is when you look at it, even, even as a manager talking to a player or whatever it is, like from ev every perspective, I think... It does stick out, like missing two penalties in a row when your team really needed you to score, like those clutch penalties. And I think someone like Salah will not abdicate the, the, the responsibility, but he might as well have, like, the, the, the team management might as well make a decision for him. And if that's the case, as long as Fabinho is on the pitch, because that could also change based on what midfield they play, even though Bicetic is out for the season, I think that Fabinho could be, and this is a very small percentage of could right now, but there has never been a doubt before, has there? So this is like a unique situation for us as FPL managers. So all that tells me is when there is a double game week, I will still captain Salah, like in game week 34, because he has two games and two games of Salah, even with just the NPXG is good enough. But if it's a single game week, like game week 32, and where you and I are free hitting, for example, I think I would captain Saka, who is playing Southampton, over Salah playing Nottingham Forest. Because that slight doubt of him not being on penalties now is enough for me, because Saka definitely has penalties. And that kind of, that kind of backs up the, the decision of captaining Saka over Salah. But I, I think uh, in terms of the penalties and you know how they impact we've seen this week already with with tony and uh, sala how how it impacts negatively once once they miss the penalty and you know you might be on tilt but in this case i think there's definitely a case to be made there yeah and and it's an interesting discussion as well just even contextualizing sala with kane because it probably also um has been the, the preference for managers to go towards sala because you have penalties of course which matches versus kane but kane uh, having such great fixtures heading towards 34 it just sort of makes it completely clear in my mind that I, I would not move early on Kane. And I, I wonder even if some managers would, would be tempted to think about going Salah less on 34 just to keep Kane and maybe just to, to go for Darwin and shop him and, 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 and bring Kane immediately back almost because that's starting to show up on my review solves, uh, interestingly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of... Uh... 
that's interesting and i think we'll we'll kind of figure it out as we get closer to these game weeks because uh, for 34 i definitely foresee a divergence in strategies as we yeah. get closer to the to the deadline yeah that's that's very sensible i think we can yeah. expect that to happen once maybe even luis diaz gets reintegrated to the liverpool team if he if he so does uh, but if yeah. we stick towards this game, we can just round out the the key discussion. Another topic is going to be captaincy. I don't think this is going to be too controversial for, for managers, but you actually have reviews picks to hand. Yes. So um, as you can see on the screen, the top three review picks are Holland, Kane, and Salah. And it is of no surprise to anyone, I think. Um, if you have 100% MD or even if you integrate market odds, I don't think these are going to change. And... Based on what we've seen in terms of Holland's fitness in game week 30 and in the Champions League game that just concluded, I think we are not sure that he's fit to an extent. And therefore, I don't see any reason not to captain him. The only reason would be if Pep says something outrageous in the press conference. Because Kane versus Bournemouth is an extremely tempting fixture, you know. But when Holland is a part of the conversation, fully fit. I think this, like, it's, I'm going to captain him. And um, I think you have the transfer algorithm picks, right? So what do they say? Yeah, it's actually a Spider-Man meme situation where it's the exact same order. Yeah. It's uh, Holland, Kane, and Salah. And for the same reasons that you discussed, I feel like Holland is, is a very clear and obvious captaincy option. Yeah. And maybe some managers would, would still dodge Holland if they're on a three hit 34 slash 37 trajectory. But I feel like most of the crowd is, is going to be on Holland this week. And, and he's going to be someone that's very hard to, to shy away from as a captaincy option. Yeah. I mean, just captain Holland. And that's, I think the summary of our podcast this week. Yeah. At least for the captaincy segment, but thank you yeah. guys so much for watching and we'll see you guys next week.